Hi, I'm Andrew Dorns. And I'm Emmy Italian, and this is a Femtechnet video project for Carl Serkin's Introduction to Gender and Sexuality Studies class at Swarthmore College. Today we're going to be discussing the keyword place in relation to online communities created by Tinder and Grindr, two apps that represent the next stage in online dating. <laughs> Do you want to tell us a little bit about these apps, uh, Andrew? I'd love to, Emmy. <laughs> these apps are created for a multitude of purposes and are designed for different types of clientele. Namely, the app called Grindr is exclusive to gay men, while Tinder allows for heterosexual, bisexual, and homosexual encounters while it is primarily a heterosexual space. And both these apps are used for the process of hookups, dates, relationships, or whatever these clientele might want to find. In this video, we will discuss these apps as creating a third space, an online space that is rooted in geographical place um, through this concept of third space. We will discuss the impact of the design of the apps on the kinds of communities and interactions that they form and that they facilitate. Specifically, we're going to look at how gender and sexual identity are performed in these spaces through the lens of Judith Butler, as well as the intersectionality that comes into play. So let's begin. Third space is a concept discussed by sociologist Howard Rheingold in his article on virtual communities, which says that there are three essential places in every person's life, the place they live, the place they work, and the place they gather for conviviality. So in ye olden days, these kind of third places would be cafes, beauty shops, pubs, town squares, where trivial idle talk would happen and where community would arise. However, with the rise of modernity, we get these physical places being replaced. So while they haven't been completely eliminated, the internet has really taken on the same kind of community building and relationship building spaces that these other physical places used to hold. Um, so thinking about dating and the kinds of places where new acquaintanceships are found and thus new relationships formed, to some extent this has moved out of the bar, the club, coffee shop, onto apps like Tinder and Grindr. Because these apps use one's physical location, there is a geographically local focus, to quote Rheingold, um, but that the apps do have a connection to larger, wider domains, uh, such as Tinder's ability to increase or decrease your search radius. And we see Tinder and Grindr as these third spaces in which gender and sexuality are performed. So drawing on Judith Butler's article, Imitation, Gender, Insubordination, Gender on Tinder and Grindr presents as performances of different kinds of femininity and masculinity, and specifically on Grindr, different performances of gay masculinity, and we're going to discuss what that really means. <laughs> we recognize Butler's assertion that gender performances are a kind of imitation for which there is no original, and that Tinder and Grindr profiles represent individuals' best imitations of their idealized gendered selves. For example, Tinder gives one photo at a time, a curated snapshot from someone's life, chosen from a Facebook profile picture that might range from a vacation photo to a night out of the bar with your friends. In contrast, when we look at a typical grinder homepage, we see many shirtless, fit, ab-flexing white guys standing in their underwear, also long-sized men with less extreme portrayals of masculinity, wearing regular clothes. However, it is common to find personal blurbs in these spaces reading, No Femmes. In other words, I don't want any feminine guys. I want my big masculine guy. The search for masculinity in this gay space is a place where we are applying a heterosexual framework in a queer space, reflecting Butler's idea that homosexuality is perceived as an imitation of the supposedly naturalness of the original heterosexuality. Of course, Butler complicates this, being Butler, <laughs> saying that there is no natural sexuality, for all sexual identity is a performance with no origin. In this way, Tinder and Grindr provides a site to enact the compulsive and compulsory repetition that can only produce the effect of its own originality. In other words, these apps perpetuate these socially constructed identities through the self-created explicitly viewing of others. So, in addition to presenting a space for explicit gender performance, other intersecting identities are brought into the fore in such image-based apps. In doing so, the space of Tinder or Grindr becomes a racialized and classed space. So, for example, on Tinder, where you get to see someone's profile picture and choose whether to swipe left to say no thanks or swipe right to say hell yes, there's a way in which that the picture that someone has chosen to put as their profile picture makes all the difference for how people interact. So thinking about um, 
if you're a stereotypical white user who's looking at someone of a different race, your brain may rationalize, oh, I can't see myself with that person and swipe right, thinking about the kind of image or portrayal, the kind of sight in which they're being depicted. If it's someone on the top of a mountain looking fine in hiking gear or something, probably have enough money to, you know, go travel on a vacation around the world. If it's someone who's sitting at home watching TV kind of photo, I don't know, something different. And it's really interesting because on Grindr, this is so much more explicit. If you pay for Grindr Extra, you can even filter by someone's race. You can explicitly say, I do not want someone who's Asian. I do not want someone who is black. I do not want someone who's Hispanic. There are ways to, to specify the type of, to, to racialize the people that you want to be with. Hmm. This uh, connects to Macintosh's idea from her article, or I don't know if it's her. From Macintosh's article, White Privilege, Unpacking the Invisible Knapsack, where... Quote, I can, if I wish, arrange to be in the company of people of my race most of the time. And this explicitly can happen on Tinder and Grindr, where you can choose who to interact with and who not to interact with. Yeah, especially when it is a geographically grounded application due to housing segregation major that happens in our country. Where you physically are determines who are going to be the people that surround you, who you're going to see on Tinder and Grindr. It's also interesting in talking about filtering out on Grindr, you can also filter out someone by their weight, by their height, by their educational status, by their HIV status, creating these incredibly specified spaces for these encounters. So, implications of this. Um, These apps, Tinder and Grindr, become a space in which probably white, upper to middle class people's privileges are further propagated. Uh, These spaces also reinforce binaries between male, female, gay, straight, leaving out much of the room for movement across the spectrums of gender and sexuality. Um, And according to Faso Sterling's Dueling Dualisms, this is just talking about gender and sex. She says, a body sex is simply too complex. There is no either or. Rather, there are shades of difference. But Grindr and Tinder do not allow for these shades of difference. So, where do we go from here? Maybe what we want to offer is an idea of thinking about when you're using these apps, what are the choices that you're making? Who are you excluding? Who are you base? What are you basing your choices off of? Um, And what things are you perpetuating? What histories are you perpetuating? What sexualities are you perpetuating? And thinking about putting this in a larger context. All right. I think that's all we have for today. I think so too, Emmy. (laughs) Thank you so much. Thank you very much for watching.